you've ever bought a Gucci firearm and it did not make you a better shooter, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Guys, uh, like, comment. The comment section is literally Mad Max in text form. So get down there and see why it is the most popular part of my channel. Guys, a couple different ways to help us. I want to acknowledge Gun Mag Warehouse. They hook us up. They support the channel. Buy Gun Mags from them. They don't ask for anything. Uh, use discount code GRANTHUM. Of course, if you want to help out the channel a little bit, you have Vertex with their plaid and weathering layers and gun bags and all that kind of cool stuff. 25% off with uh, discount code GRANTHUM. And of course, you have um, LEX Ammo. LEX Ammo, 6% off. Train. With that being said, I want to get into this video. Now, this video is going to be a series of videos comparing different weapons and weapon platforms. Now, before we kind of do that, I, there's a lot of nuance within the AR world, and I wanted to kind of hit on one of those nuances with a uh, kind of throwback comparison to one of the early M16 variants versus a modern uh, AR. So what we have here is we have a M16A1 Vietnam era production uh, upper. So the upper is Vietnam, it's of course late Vietnam era with a birdcage flash higher pencil barrel and all that good stuff on it. Uh, the lower is aero precision. A couple things I did that are uh, inaccurate of course are the A2 stock because I had an A1 stock that completely broke right before filming started and the show must go on and the stock really didn't matter to me that much. What really matters is the upper which is kind of the characteristic of the gun. Um, A1 socks are a little bit shorter than A2 socks, I'm different material, all that kind of stuff. But Using A2, of course, grip, you know that my wrists are a little jacked up from the military, so I'm using a reduced angle grip a la Magpul. Um, I just prefer them because, you know, I don't want to hurt my wrists. Uh, trigger is all mil-spec, mil -spec, all the internals are mil-spec, and all that good stuff. So we have our mostly uh, period um, uh, stuff. Of course, the upper is period and the lower is not. So that is our test platform for the M16A1. The competitor is a current production BCM 11.5 MCMR, which is an M-Lock type rail. Uh, these are used in certain units or in certain SWAT units um, all throughout the world. Uh, they are well proven and vetted. So I wanted to take this one with all the accoutrements that would be used in a modern weapon and compare it to a non-modern weapon. I thought it'd be kind of fun to do a couple drills and then talk about it a little bit because there's a lot of stuff to be said about that. So when it comes to the drills that I ran, I, took, I picked different drills that would emphasize um, kind of different points of training and different points that maybe certain uh, of these rifles would be more uh, adept at. So understand that what really matters is training. So you can put you know super untrained guy on both of these and they're just going to suck. Um, so what does matter is training, and I, and I always point that out. But um, you know, it's not to say that I'm like an amazing shooter or anything like that. There are shooters who are a million bajillion times better than me, tons of them. So the first drill that I ran was a basic um, three-shot transition. So I had two targets, 10 yards apart, 10 yards away from me. These two targets are steel. So I'd shoot on one target on the left, shoot the other target on the right, and shoot the target on the left. What this is checking on is transitioning, uh, keeping sight picture, all that type of stuff, trigger control, and of course throttle control. So uh, I thought it would be a great drill. Of course, the M16A1 is at a disadvantage being a longer gun that's more kind of length that I have to swing around and of course running iron sights. But we ran it, so let's see how it went. Um, also with these drills, I'd run uh, one rifle first and the other rifle first, and the next drill, the one rifle that went last would then go first. That way I wasn't getting like too used to uh, a drill and then you know, one or the other gun would get an advantage. So I did the best possible, of course. Um, this is not scientific at all. There wasn't a good control, but uh, still interesting. So uh, with the uh, three-shot transition, let's uh, go ahead and see it. So at the M16 first. 189. 83, all right. So my fastest time on that was 1.83. Um, I typically did it in around 1.92. And again, again, I ran this three times with each rifle and each drill. Um, so about 1.93 was average, 1.83 being my fastest. Uh, it was hard um, when transitioning with the M16A1 because while I had the larger aperture on this rifle, uh, it's just, if I'm not dead center lined up with that stock, um, if I lose that rear aperture, then 
uh, it's going to be hard to take a shot. So, of course, you can kind of understand and point and have good pointability and kind of good training and good body position. That helps a lot. But if you don't have a good sight picture, it's a little bit more difficult. So definitely swinging between targets as quick as I could was a little bit more difficult with the iron sights. Um, I next ran it with the AR. So go ahead and see that. Only three. First try. This is four. All right. So my fastest time was 1.65. Um, my first run that I did was 1.83, which is the same time as the M16A1. It was very easy to swing between targets due to the large window of the EOTech. The reticle made it very easy to transition between targets. So I had to try a lot less. Um, what's interesting is that the uh, BCM is an 11.5. But due to the muzzle brake, it has about the same recoil impulse that you'd have from the M16A1. Uh, I know it's slightly unfair because, uh, you know, it's got a muzzle brake on it. It's got the war comp and this has a flash hider. But I think it's interesting to note um, kind of where firearms technology is kind of gone and kind of uh, the type of recoil that we can get out of short barreled rifles versus, versus the uh, longer barreled varieties. So after I ran the... Uh, target transition dip drill, I ran over to a longer drill. So we went out to 120 yards. We're shooting on a reduced size Ipsic steel silhouette target. Is that one third uh, size of normal Ipsic uh, steel. So it was a very small target to shoot at 120. So I did um, two kneeling and two standing. So I started off with the AR. So let's go ahead and see that. So I did that one in 8.68 seconds as my fastest run. Usually ran it around 8.70, 8.80. It was pretty cold out that day. Um, I wasn't having the best time on the uh, AR. It was the first run at distance. There's no warm up there. So a little bit of a disadvantage for it, but you know what, those are the numbers and that's what happened. I then ran it with the M16A1. My fastest time was 7.40, so about a second faster, well, a little less than a second faster than the AR, and then usually I ran it at around 8.6, 8.5, so slightly faster than the AR. Maybe that was because I was warmed up, but uh, the numbers stand. It was actually very easy to take long shots with the, uh, with the M16A1. I think that's due to the thick stock. It's nice and comfortable and long, and the handguard just kind of lends itself to... Uh, uh, kind of more accurate long distance shooting for a variety of reasons, which I'll talk about uh, once we kind of get to the talking portion of this video, which we're already on. <laughs> so after I did the two kneeling, two standing at 120, I kept the same distance, but I added another target. So we had two targets that were five yards apart and they were 120 yards away from me. Both of them reduced sized uh, Ipsic uh, silhouette targets. And uh, I did four kneeling. So again, two on one, two on the other, and standing, two on one, two on the other. So let's go ahead and see how that went. First at the M16. So at the M16A1, I ran it in about 10.29 at my fastest. Uh, it usually was around 10.4, 10.3 on the other two runs that I did. I then ran it with the AR. And I ran that in 9.7 as about my fastest. Around 9.75 was about the slowest I did it in. So pretty similar uh, to its fastest run. So after I did that bit of distance, and I could see that the uh, two platforms were pretty similar at distance, uh, even when moving and kind of rushing up, I decided to run a build drill. So build drill is pretty famous in the pistol world. It's kind of modified it a little bit for... Um, Rifle use, and it's been done millions of times. I take no credit for this. Um, so the build drill I ran was at 14 yards with an Ipsic um, cardboard silhouette target. So the goal was six rounds in the A zone, as fast as you could do it. Um, typically with the pistol, it's at seven yards in under three seconds or something like that. Um, so I tried to keep it under two seconds when I was doing this. So I first ran it with the AR.
So with the AR, I did it in about 1.25, 1.22. Slowest one was about 1.33. Um, good cadence, very easy. Um, I was kind of taking my time a little bit on this. I was trying to make sure I was getting good hits while uh, being good and fast and not sacrificing accuracy. After I ran out the AR, I ran out the M16A1. Uh, and I did it in around 1.47 at my fastest, usually around 1.50. And that's due to the fact that I'm running a super nice trigger on the uh, on the AR. So I'm running one of the military triggers from Geisley. Uh, they're just phenomenal with an extremely light pull and reset. Versus with the M16A1, I am running a straight mil spec trigger uh, with a you know five to six pound pull, a longer reset. Uh, it's not really that bad, but it's definitely a little bit slower. So I actually owe this more to the trigger than I do to the designs themselves because they, they were both very fast to get on a target, to pull um, and shoot. They were both had very soft recoil. And actually shooting at one target with the M16A1 is very easy to keep the iron sights on that target as I was firing. Finally, the last drill that I did was a drill that I knew the AR would uh, excel at over the M16A1. And this isn't so much to say, wow, how much the M16A1 sucks, but rather to point out that the 20 inch barrels on ARs are just hard to maneuver. So this is a cover drill. We had steel at 35 yards away, and then we had a tree uh, with a barricade in front of us. So what I had to do is I had to maneuver the weapon without dipping it um, uh, around that tree. So typically the method to do that, if you come around a corner or something like that in CQB, is to bring the rifle up and over your shoulder versus dipping it. That way you can have the weapon up. So I ran this drill with the AR knowing full well that I would do very good. So I ran with the AR. Did it in 5.7 seconds. I then ran it with the M16A1. Did that in 6.84 seconds at the fastest, usually around seven seconds, with AR is around six seconds at the slowest. So about a full second faster, and that's of course due to the fact that with the uh, M16A1, I had another 10 inches of barrel length to pull back over my shoulder, plus a much longer stock to deal with. So it was just harder to maneuver around, and I knew that would be the case. I just wanted to illustrate that um, there definitely is something to be said for a smaller gun. So with all that stuff, all the drills that we kind of did there, um, I think what was really interesting to me is I had buddies run them as well. And when my buddies ran them, uh, they were they were pretty slow with both guns because they weren't uh, they didn't shoot as much or anything like that. And that's nothing against them. They're they're good. They shoot uh, you know recreationally a couple times a year. But rather to point out that what really matters is training. If you really train with your gun, it the gun does matter, right? Obviously, um, this is going to offer me a much greater advantage in terms of sight picture and capabilities and a couple other things over the M16A1 just due to the advancements that have been made in light technology and optic technology and XYZ. But that being said, if all you have is you know an M16A1 or an A2 or some other not as good upper and you're like, oh man, I should really get a better gun, really... What matters is dry firing, practicing, and shooting rounds. That is what really matters when it comes to uh, shooting. I think that's something that uh, can easily be kind of extrapolated from the data that we had from our drills, where the M16A1, although slower on four of the drills, was only slower by maybe half a second or a little bit more. And I understand that's a little bit on really short drills, but at the same time, it's very controllable and very usable. The system still stands. And a lot of that is due to the fact that it was just very well engineered for its time. The M16A1 is very lightweight. Um, it weighs around 6.5 pounds. Now, I know that's unfair to compare it directly because this um, AR has a lot of stuff on it, including EOTech sight, PEC-15, a weapon light, and mounts and all that kind of stuff. But these, this weapon actually weighs more, even though it's shorter, than the M16A1. And of course, there is less capability. I don't have optics or uh, ability to project IR lasers or illuminators or anything like that. But I guess what I want to point out is how well balanced the M16A1 and the A2 are. The A4 is a little bit front heavy, but they're just very well balanced. And you can see uh, 
you know, the first time somebody picked one, one of these up um, to go shoot it in trials, how kind of revolutionary it would have been for the time. Comparing it to something like an M14 or an M1 Garand or an FN FAL, it's just a very lightweight, very controllable weapon system. So let's kind of start at the front of the gun, kind of move back and compare it a little bit to our BCM and about some of the differences that we see versus modern ARs. So first off, at the very front of the gun, we have the birdcage uh, flash hider. This is one of the older ones. Um, it definitely is not as good as the newer ones that are out there where you have the little blast shield in the bottom, that way you're not kicking up dust. Um, it didn't work spectacularly well, um, but is definitely doable. The M16A2 birdcage flash hider, in my opinion, is much better, and I actually do like those quite a bit on my guns. Moving back um, to the barrel, we do have a pencil uh, you know, profile barrel. They're very lightweight. Um, there's things to be said about that. We've kind of seen a kind of move back to enhance lightweight uh, barrel profile designs. A couple differences, of course, versus the older designs, but uh, there's a lot to be said about them. Easier to move the gun, not as heavy, and uh, you know these uh, rifles are not meant to be used as like a squad automatic weapon. They shouldn't be just dumping full auto mag after mag. Um, so of course they do suffer from accuracy as they heat up a lot more, but that being said, I think they're more than adequate for most of the uh, things that you need uh, in a rifle for an infantryman or something like that. Now let's compare this to the BCM 11.5. This is an 11.5 inch barrel. So on the end we have a Surefire War Comp, which is a combination flash hider and compensator on the end of the gun. So of course the, the compensator on the end of the gun helps keep it very controllable and make the recoil just as light as the M16A1, which is a lot pretty cool. Not as quite as light as the M16A4 or A2, but um, pretty Pretty freaking controllable. Of course, this one has the ability to mount a suppressor and other accoutrements and that type of stuff for Gucci LARPing and all that stuff. Um, but the barrel is an enhanced lightweight profile for this particular design. And when it comes to barrels, um, both these barrels are very well made. But um, what can be said about the M16A1 is that 5.56 out of a 20 inch barrel is just absolutely devastating. That was what the 5.56 was originally designed for, and it does very well out of rifle length barrels. Compare that to a 5.56 coming out of 11.5, um, you're seeing a much reduced um, terminal effectiveness uh, out to distance. Now, of course, you're gonna have the guy saying, hey, okay, go out to 500 yards and get shot with this and tell me if you'd wanna get shot with it. Of course not. But if we're kind of comparing straight, um, the M16A1 with its barrel length, uh, is able to more effectively use a 5.56 round out to distance compared to a shorter barrel. So let that be said. Another great thing about the M16 uh, A1 is the ability to mount a bayonet. The bayonet! The bayonet is designed to kill! So who knows why I would ever need a bayonet, but it looks cool. And that's kind of the point. So this, of course, is anachronistic. Uh, these bayonets were not. Uh, period correct but that being said <laughs> bayonets are awesome you have a front sight post that is fixed the one problem with that of course is that the handguard attaches to it this is a non-free floating barrel now how much does free floating matter um with the m16a1 i'm easily able to do around 1.2 to around closer to 2 moa with good military ammo um, i'm a little bit more accurate with the bcm i think you can push uh, slightly smaller groups so of course free floating is a great design and it, it allows for better accuracy. But I think a lot of people get really kind of hung up on free floating when rather they should just actually go practice and shoot some more. So of course, this weapon was not designed with optics in mind, uh, so there's no way to you know take down the front sight post or not have one. Compare that to the BCM 11.5, which is a modern design. Uh, the gas block is underneath the handguard and there's of course no front sight post. Uh, to be seen on this. If you want to add a front sight post, you could add them to the rails. As you can see on this one, I have opted to not run any iron sights at all on this particular gun because of all the ridiculous redundancies that I have on it. The handguard is kind of an interesting thing on the M16A1. I've always loved the look of the triangular handguards on these older M16s. They just look great to me. And what I really like about them is that uh, they taper out to the end. So what that means is that when you're pulling this weapon into your shoulder to fire it, the 
taper because it gradually gets larger at the end uh, allows you to kind of pull back into this and kind of use it as a hand stop in many ways. Now, of course, the handguard is a little too smooth for me. I wish it had a little bit more texture. There's, of course, ways to fix that, but I wanted to keep it mostly unadulterated uh, going through this video. But the triangular handguard just looks cool. Now, it does get very hot. These triangle handguards get very hot, but you know what? It's just a classic look, and I've always loved the look of them. So if this is something that you're looking for, I mean, I can't say no to you. Compare that to the BCM 11.5, it is running a MCMR, M-Lock handguard. This thing is all business, it has mounting solutions for grips and lights and pecs and all that kind of stuff, and that's what it was designed for. It is very thin, very easy to use, and if you need any type of handstop, you attach it. In this case, I'm running a BCM CAG from Haley Strategic, and that allows you to pull the weapon back in your shoulder. So, this handguard has a wonderful lockup, in fact, in many ways, superior to the lockup of many other handguards. So there definitely have been advancements in technology and the BCM MCMR is definitely a really good um, kind of show force when it comes to that. Okay, moving back into the receiver itself on the M16A1 up, upper receiver group, you have no brass deflector. <laughs> so no brass, brass deflector. You do have a forward assist that is a teardrop type forward assist. It looks like a teardrop as you can see right here. Um, very popular among military enthusiasts. And then we, of course, have our carry handle. So the carry handle is of the A1 variety. So the uh, system to adjust the sights is slightly different. You have uh, windage, and then elevation is done up at the front. So not as robust as the M16A2, M16A4 type uh, sights, but nonetheless, very usable. Um, has two apertures for more precision or less precision for uh, being a little bit more open for, you know, closer type shooting. Um, I do find it very usable. Again, the weapon's very balanced. You can use a carry handle to carry this thing. Uh, one problem with the M16A1 is, of course, sling choice because this is meant to kind of be slung on your shoulder. Of course, Rangers and many other people have figured out solutions to that where you wrap a little bit of paracord up around the front sight post, loop that around your shoulder, uh, have a little duct tape contraption. That way you can have the... Uh, shoulder strap coming off the back, pretty much like a two point, very much so like you'd have with this. And uh, those early kind of solutions came up that were come up with by various people operating in different theaters is what led to a lot of the innovation that we see today in the AR platform. So we can thank all those dudes for doing all that kind of stuff. One point that I want to bring up also is a thick stock. Um, great for target shooting, that type of stuff. However, if you're doing any type of shooting where you're moving or you have body armor on, these are not the best because it doesn't allow you to adjust length of pull. Because again, not everybody is the same height and that can lead to some problems. That is why I love a stock that can be adjusted. And that's why they are pretty much the gold standard nowadays. So here I have a BCM stock. Um, the B5 socks are great, the LMT socks are great, the car socks are great. Find a stock that works for you, but that adjustable length of pull is gonna be really important, especially when you start wearing body armor or something like that. So there's a lot to be said for those types of stocks. Um, the only last thing that I kinda wanna bring up is triggers. Um, there is a definite advantage for the AR with its nicer Geisse trigger compared to the mil spec trigger. So that definitely influenced the, um, the testing. But again, what it really comes down to, guys, with everything that I've done, and I know I harp on this all the time, is training. Training really matters. I train a lot with my firearms. I shoot a lot. I do a lot of dry firing. Because of that, the times between these two were not that different. And again, that's... Uh, again, another point to make is that I don't shoot a whole lot with iron sights. If I had practiced a lot more with iron sights, I have no doubt that I'd probably be much closer or maybe even faster with iron sights. So stop freaking out so much about the gun and actually get out there and shoot because that's what really matters. Now, there are many cons that um, we kind of haven't, that we've already talked about. Um, this was not made in the mind of being able to mount optics. So that is, of course, a problem because optics are a wonderful thing to have on your weapons. Um, the barrel's on free floating, so slightly less, less accuracy. The length of the barrel can be a problem. Of course, you get better velocity out of it, but that being said, modern loadings of 5.56 do excellent out of shorter barrels like 11.5 or 12.5. And uh, finally, the handguard just gets hot and, of course, doesn't uh, offer as many mounting solutions. And, of course, many people have figured out ways to get around that with various mounting solutions to mount weapon lights or what have you onto it. But there is no doubt that the M16A1 is antiquated. It's not obsolete, but it's definitely obsolescent in the fact that there are much better options out there. Now, if that's all you have and you don't have any money, doesn't matter, man. Get out there and train because that's what really matters. Guys, I hope you like this comparison a little bit. There's a ton that can be said uh, between these two firearms, 
but what really matters is training. So get some good training from Cogworks, Haley Strategic, which is my, which is Haley, Travis Haley's company, uh, Bear Solutions, and of course, Esoteric. Um, if one of you guys goes out there and runs a honest to God M16A1 through one of the courses, I will literally send you something cool. Uh, just send me a picture of you running it and I'll confirm it with the instructor, but that would be pretty awesome. Guys, thank you for watching. You guys rock, appreciate everything you guys have said. And finally, as always, stay looking cool. I've got nothing else for you. Okay, final note. Um, a lot of people have been contacting me about buying night vision or buying optics or buying what have you. And they're like, hey, I'm kind of pushing my budget a little bit, but I really want to get night vision. Or I'm really pushing my budget a little bit, but I want to get this optic. Um, don't. Uh, don't crush yourself financially um, to, to get like an optic or night vision. Buy a nice basic gun shoot a lot of course optics are great but honestly if it's not within your budget don't stretch yourself so much to where you're hurting yourself uh make sure that you're financially stable don't go into massive amounts of debt i'm serious um i watched a dude put like uh all of his like he almost bankrupted himself buying pvs 15s and it's like dude night vision's really cool but if you don't have the money for it um again don't don't just go and bankrupt yourself doing it because again, the most interesting people that I've ever met in my life or dealt with in my life don't have cool things, they have cool experiences or they're cool people because they're educated and they're intelligent and they have a lot of life experiences to speak on. So I understand that you know night vision, skydiving, all that stuff gives you life experiences but there's many ways to do it. Don't bankrupt yourself, make yourself an interesting person without things because things are, are something that don't matter so much. What it matters is you and your experiences and your intelligence and yeah, just the whole whole thing. So take that and develop that rather than bankrupting yourself. Guys, appreciate you. Uh, if you watch the very end here, you know my normal thing is Big Daddy Unlimited. It is a subscription service where you can pretty much buy things for cheaper. Of course, you have to pay to get into the website. Is it going to be worth it? How much do you buy? If you're buying a, you know one or two products per year, yeah, it's going to be worth it. If you're buying nothing per year, of course, it's not going to be worth it. That's kind of up to you. But you know I support things that make sense. Big Daddy Unlimited makes sense. Get in there. I have a little link in my description. Use that. Finally, ultra fans, if you've gotten to this point, what I want you to do, I always make these up on the spot. So let's see how this goes. I want you to name... The grossest thing you've ever eaten. God, I'm super regretting saying that already. Go in the comment section. Go ahead and say what it is. Bye, guys.